So, um, welcome everyone. Welcome to the last Artist Now talk of the semester. Um, I that went fast. Um, obviously, we still have a number of weeks to go for, for my course, but um, tonight is our last public lecture, and it all starts up again next fall with a full season, and spring's all set too. Um, so, I should give some thanks to the people who um, made this possible. Um, any students out there in the Black and Gold Committee? Do I see any? Okay. Yeah, I see, I see uh, Corey. I don't recognize you without your, your uh, mustache and decoy. Um, so, Black and Gold Committee is the student group that advocates for where differential tuitions money is going to be spent. And, and they talk to the Dean of the Peck School of the Arts and work with faculty and funding to, to advocate um, where this, this allotment of money is going to go to improve life on campus for students and various programs. And Black and Gold Committee a number of years ago said, we want a visiting artist lecture series. So that was a student-driven initiative that happened. So I guess our first round of applause has to go to students. The power of students shaping the university in ways they'd like to see it. They see something not happening. It, for instance, a great visiting arts lecture, they made it happen. So, so much respect to the students that uh, made that happen, the students that sit on black and gold today. Um, there's also a committee within the art and design department that oversees the visiting artist series, Artists Now. Um, and that rotates over time, but some names to thank is uh, Ryan, Christine, Nathaniel, am I missing anyone else in the current roster? So those folks uh, help, they, they ask the faculty to put forth names, and then they decide upon the roster, and a lot of hours goes in, into that decision-making process for this year and the following year. So a huge thanks and a round of applause to Ryan, Christine, and Nathaniel. And Kim and Yevgenia, who helped lead our department, uh, are huge champions of Artists Now. And essentially are here every time we have a talk, which is incredible, with the schedules they hold. So, huge round of applause to Kim and Yevgenia. So, a lot of work goes into it. So thanks everyone for making this happen. It's, it's truly an honor to teach this course and to see this incredible roster of artists come through. I was a visiting artist in Michigan on Monday and I came home sick as a dog. Um, so after our talk tonight, uh, Ibrahim and I are going to take cards. Because I was planning on doing the second half lecture with you from 8.45 to 9.30, but it's not happening. Big round of applause for you. <laughs> And personally, the biggest round of applause for me goes to my TA, Ibrahim Gunbar. Thank you, Ibrahim. Ibrahim did an exceptional job. All the students in my class know it. They were graced by an incredible lecture that he gave. And he has been uh, an incredible TA, not just this semester, but all. So thank you kindly, Ibrahim. Outstanding work. So, um, I'm going to introduce Jessica Mila Ganger, who's going to introduce our guest tonight, who's coming from Chicago and knows many of the faculty here. So, we're inviting a friend up onto our stage. So, so welcome, Mike. Uh, yeah, I have a sonic boom voice, but this is helping. Um, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you, Nicholas, for providing this uh, opportunity. And I, I think this is a fantastic class, so you're all just so lucky to be made a good choice in rolling here. Um, I'd like to introduce Paul Cantonese. He's a hybrid media artist, and I've been following him kind of like this, this fan. Uh, he's really active in the Southern Graphics um, International Organization and provides many serves on many panels, provides lots of lectures, so that's where I got hooked into his work. Um, and I've been following him and kind of a, a creepy fan. <laughs> I, <laughs> I attended, I wanted to attend all of, you know, he was presenting several 
people at several different venues during this last conference in San Francisco. Some of the students who are in here attended that conference. And I got on the wrong bus and I just was devastated. But anyway, um, so I'm looking forward to his presentation tonight uh, so I can catch up on what I missed out on in, in San Francisco. Um, he's the Associate Chair and Associate Professor in the Department of Interdisciplinary Arts at Columbia College in Chicago. Uh, his artwork has been exhibited widely, including the Whitney um, of American Art, the New Museum of Contemporary Art, San Francisco MoMA, Artist Gallery, La Villette, and Stuttgart Film Venter, among others. Paul is a recipient of numerous grants and awards, including commissions for the creation of artwork from turbulence.org as well as rhizome.org. And yes, he is a good friend to uh, a lot of the uh, faculty colleagues here at UWM, and I look forward to you know, extending this conversation uh, later after the, the show and spending time with them. Um, I'm really interested in how he overlaps digital practices and traditional media, and I'm really looking forward to, to seeing his work and hearing has, what he has to say. So I'd like to invite Paul to the stage and welcome him to the WM. So uh, the first piece, uh, first body work I really want to kind of talk about is from kind of a while ago now, uh, but I, I hope uh, it can give us some framing to think about this um, jumping back and forth and up and down and left and right, uh, in and out through media. Uh, this, is a, this is a project, uh, the, the title is Displaced Reliquary. Uh, it's from 2004, 2005. This is actually a commission for Rhizome. Um, uh, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know rhizome.org, it's definitely worth looking at. It's uh, 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 one of the largest uh, place, uh, places for uh, supporters of net art, but it's, it's really grown well beyond that. It's, it's roots, as a, it's grassroots, uh, it's grassroots roots, hmm, there's got to be a better way to say that. Uh, it's grassroots beginnings, uh, you know, over 20 years ago, uh, uh, was it worth became a forum uh, and became a place for artists who were working with the net uh, to see themselves as members of a community. Uh, and they've just exploded in terms of, you know, they, they, they have a 
formal affiliation with the New Museum in New York. They have this huge commissioning uh, program of which uh, this is part of that happens every year. And it's just, it's just a, a lovely, lovely, lovely um, organization. Anyway, so um, this, I was, between like 2003 and 2006 or so, I had been thinking about um, uh, a bunch of different things. For this body of work, I was really thinking about the Game Boy Advance as a gaming appliance. And I wondered, I asked myself, um, could I approach this device pre-literate of games at all? Is this device, is this technology, which is so capable of being intimate, could it be used for other things? And so I was thinking about what was on my mind, at least when I came to this work, even though it's got some, some baggage that it may or may not overcome. Um, I was thinking a lot about what it would, might, might mean to create virtual artist books in these little tiny handheld curiosity cabinets. I was thinking about what is it, what might it mean to create little digital Cornell boxes. Um, and so this, this piece of Misplaced Reliquary was in response to a call from Rhizome uh, for, uh, they had a, to have a commissioning series, and that particular year they wanted people to make, uh, to respond to the notion of game art. And so I said, oh, this is perfect. Um, I too work with game, but uh, rather than thinking about game like, um, video games or a comment on the culture of game, I really was curious about uh, my collection practice and the notion of game as in the hunt uh, and the, the objects that I hunt. And I, I thought of this project where I could create a reliquary of these little animal saint like bones kind of represented in this way. While I was, while I was working on this project, um, and I, I think I'll go to the next slide just so you can see it in installation view, uh, to understand that this is actually a project where the Game Boy Advance is actually paired with uh, a letter-pressed, uh, hand-bound uh, book. And uh, that book is actually um, bound in a, like a very, very soft, supple, calfskin left leather. And the book is, is not like, um, the book can be picked up and viewed and, and touched the same way the, the Game Boy itself, people have this intimate relationship with it. And so for this, this series, uh, intimacy is definitely a giant part of what I am thinking about. And in many of my works, um, there's, there's uh, one, one thread that I, I, I'll, I'll poke at it each time I'm seeing it, uh, to help us see it. Uh, one way to achieve intimacy is by creating, for, at least for me, is to create these, these small um, uh, objects that actually have, their, where the physical materials are inviting and where they uh, hopefully slow down the heartbeat of the viewer and hopefully what they do is they create a very intimate space between you and the game board, you and the book. There's something about both of those formats that I felt really spoke to one another. And I always really enjoyed watching people use this piece because regardless of whether they were familiar with um, the Game Boy and all of its cultural baggage and its background, you would see people just walk up to it just like as, as easily as the book, just pick it up and kind of work through it. And there's something about that level of immediacy and intimacy which is really curious to me. Um, the, the book is actually uh, this, these little tales from the curator of the, of the reliquary talking about the objects in the book. It's actually, um, uh, it's actually the, the, I don't know if I would say the trick of it is, uh, it's actually, um, for those of you who have done handmade books, uh, it's actually the same signature over and over and over again. So um, there's actually maybe uh, 20 or 24 stories in it, and I, but I wanted the book to have a very particular weight. I wanted it to have this very particular tome-like shape to it. So I printed that signature over and over and over again, and then you'd eventually loop, which is similar to in the Game Boy itself, um, which is a grid of these images of these different relics. Uh, you'd actually eventually loop back around, so there was, there was some relationship between the organizational principle of the images in the Game Boy and the organizational principle where I was thinking of the codex form. Um, just so you understand, uh, actually, uh, this project, what's, what, uh, another facet I guess I'll try and look at uh, this project through is, it actually exists, uh, Misplaced Reliquary exists both as a physical installation as well as a browser-based installation. And I, I have, over the years, working with um, the browser and online work, even though net art is a very particular stance for how people will construct work for online, 
I, I started to distance myself from that just because I saw that my work wasn't um, addressing some of the same concerns in what the word net art means. And so for me, I thought about the space of the browser as a space of installation. And so when I think about misplaced reliquary, um, I could have made my life easier and made one single thing, but really it's all of these simultaneously. So even though I'm saying there's the browser-based version and there's the book version and there's the Game Boy version, really it's all of these things at the same time. And it's just not so neat. Uh, and it's that thing about convenience. It's that same idea of dropping maybe the hybrid and the media and the interdisciplinary and everything, and just sort of going out into that risky territory of just artists. Um, in any case, uh, so this piece is still online, the writings are online, so it's, it's accessible in sort of a democratic kind of way, and then it's also sort of in these, you know, these hard-to-find objects. Um, ooh, I'll just keep, ooh, I should keep moving. Um, some of the other projects that I was working on at that time, um, this is uh, oh, that's a terrible image, so let's go to the next slide. That's also a terrible image. Oh, goodness. When they get big, they don't want the same. So, uh, What's happening here is, uh, at least uh, this is from a series of digital Cornell boxes that I was creating. This is actually earlier work. This is from around 2003, 2004, while I was an artist in residence at the Kala Art Institute in Berkeley, California, um, which is a great place. It's really funny, when I went there, uh, when I saw the call for applications, um, I saw that they had a call for people doing work with electronic media and experimentation. And then it said something about printmaking. Now, any of the instead of printmakers would say, oh my goodness, Kala is this really incredibly world-famous place that people go to do printmaking. But at the time, I, I really knew, knew nothing about all that. Uh, it was, I was just interested because I was like, oh, I'm working with electronics, I'm working with these things, and I should go there. And uh, as it turned out, um, there was all these folks working on print. And that had, um, as you will learn, uh, a huge effect on my career and also uh, in terms of my thinking about uh, materials. So uh, the reason we're a little pixelated here is, first of all, I should have not zoomed it all the way up, but second of all, uh, the Game Boy, you're really working on this incredibly tiny space. Like, if I recall, it was something like 230 pixels by 140 pixels, something like that. So really not a ton of room. These, this is, uh, these two, this image and this image are both from a digital Cornell box uh, titled um, Medicinal Craft of Cephalopods. Uh, and here we have actually a, like a ganged up image where you can see some of, some of them, uh, some of the different images uh, that, I was, that I was working on. This, this work was really, um, the thing about this work that really got me and why, while I was working at Kalal working on this, uh, and I'll kind of go here for a second, is um, oh, for working on Game Boy at the time, there, there really wasn't, it wasn't like Nintendo <coughs> gave me a developer's license and said, hey, you should totally do this. Uh, in fact, I, I needed to work with, um, on the one hand, I was working with uh, some homebrew game development code from Germany. There was this, like, there was like this whole underground movement of people who had reverse engineered how to work with the Game Boy, and I was able to take some of the work that they did and understand how, instead of making a game out of it, how I might use that as a material that I could, I could make these artist book kind of shapes for myself. And then I also had to work with all this hardware from Hong Kong that people would use to try and like, uh, like, uh, like people who wanted to like take ROMs off of Game Boy carts and like actually like you know sort of maybe steal games and then give them to friends on on their own cards. Um, I, I was working with some of that hardware to actually take some of my homebrew games and put them on my own cartridges and, and do some of the same stuff. And as I'm working and I'm programming these animations, of which I'll I'll show a little clip here in a sec. Um, the, the programming of the animation had this, there was this very physical way of working because in order to make the animation happen, ooh, I keep going, sorry, loud, quiet. Uh, let me jump out and show you the animation for a sec. I find the video tends to work a little bit better this way. Um, what kind of let's go here? Let's see if that's that way. Yes. So just, I just want to show you the animation to make it make a little more sense. Um, and I'm not going to zoom it up just so you can see how tiny this is. Uh, 
you kind of see some of these, these little details of the eyes and the way they move. Um, so the, the reason why I wanted to show this is so that you understand that each pixel here, it's, it's not like there was a tool to make that go. It's, it's more like, you know, you have a text editor up, and it's like, okay, that, that pixel's gonna be white. Okay, now it's gonna be off, now it's gonna be this, now it's gonna be this. So it's really, um, uh, it's, not, it's not so much like I was going after a painstaking process, but I evidently invented one for myself. Um, so, uh, and what I noticed was that here I was, all hunched over, and I got my computer screen, and I'm typing away, and I'm all like huddled up, and I look over, and of course, oh, and by the way, at Kala, so they had this like really gorgeous electronic studio, and then like 10,000 square feet of all of this printing equipment that's totally crazy go nuts. And it's like, I'm watching people working with letterpress, and what are they doing? They're all hunched over the composing stick, and they're putting these little things, and it's like, oh my goodness, look at you. Look at what you're doing. Literally, this, this just me looking at another human body hunched over, I said, we're doing the same thing, whatever we're doing here. And then when they started to describe, they said, oh yeah, we're, we've got these, these individual letters, and we're putting them together, and we're building up this thing. We're building up a matrix to print. I was like, whoa, back up. You're building up a matrix. I'm building up a matrix. We're doing the same thing. Your pixel's got, they are in the shape of letters. My pixel's just square. My pixel and matrix are okay. And so I, I started to really just, I, I just, my, my mind was blown a little bit, but I was, I was so excited at that moment. And actually, um, like I said, this is the, this is earlier work. Uh, it, it was it was working, and seeing people working with letter presses is actually what drew me uh, for this this later project that I started. I said we weren't going to go in order. Um, this later project here, where I was doing this handset type for this book, is it was because, and it was at my time of collab because of just trying to respond to the things that I'm seeing and allowing yourself to kind of say, oh my goodness, I need to respond to that. There's actually a connection here in the material. Uh, there is actually something going on. Uh, and so, the second thing that happened, um, and when I was talking in uh, in San Francisco just two or three weeks ago, gosh, three weeks ago? It doesn't feel like three weeks ago anymore. It feels like it was either a thousand weeks ago or last, just a minute ago, I'm not sure which one. Um, so, uh, time is strange that way. Uh, I was on a panel called Synaptic Leaps, and one of the things I was talking about with people, and I, I do like this metaphor, uh, is how uh, you know we we move, how we migrate from one idea to the next. What the borders are between an idea and then when it becomes an expression, and then when it becomes a final outcome. I'm not really sure that those things are as clearly done as as say a portfolio could lead you to believe. I think there's a lot more living motion for artists, uh, and, and I, I would say that's that's something to not forget. It's okay that there's gonna be snapshots when a thing are done, and there's gonna be motion, this kinetic motion that's really a type of life. Anyway, so um, when I was working on letterpress then, again, really not a printmaker at that point, and I'm not even sure that I would go so far as to call myself one now, even though there's reasons that might make that true. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I said to myself, uh, you know what's really interesting here, this is me talking to myself, Wow, you know what's really interesting is, uh, I wonder, uh, since I have kind of a geeky background, I was like, I bet I could build some drawing software, and wouldn't it be interesting, uh, I, somebody should control, like a computer-controlled mill, to carve these blocks, the relief blocks, and you should probably be able to print that on, on a letterpress or something. And so, I, I did that, um, but, and then I'll show some, some images that, to, to give a sense of these little, um, these are little three, Three inch, I was going to say three foot, but these are little three inch wide by four foot, four inch tall uh, prints that are much larger on screen. Um, where, uh, where I actually I kind of invented or wrote up this this drawing software in a language called Processing, uh, which is fairly easy to use. And, and honestly, I've done a lot of programming, so it's, that's not the the important part. Is whether it was difficult or not. The important part was I just had this moment where I took a leap. I had never, the, the word, I guess, part here is to understand is, I hadn't really done hardly any printmaking at that moment, and I had done no CNC whatsoever when I made the decision that, in fact, it was going to be no big deal to write drawing software, to control this machine, to carve these blocks, to print on a device that I had never used. It just seemed like the thing to do at the time. Um, and I'm glad that I was so, uh, uh, I guess, uh, I guess I, I'm just glad I just went and did it. Um, 
But the truth is that it could have gone off the rails in a million different places. And the reason why I think it ultimately worked out uh, is because of generosity. Um, and, and I mean the generosity of many, many, many others. And so by starting with an idea, just because I don't necessarily know, know what the path is, or what the answer is, or what, how it's going to work out, that doesn't mean that I can't reach out to many, 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 many people and, and, have, and we work together to find solutions, but certainly when it comes to process. Uh, and, and honestly, that can be extended out to concept or, or anything else. Problems are, are great when we, we solve them together. In any case, uh, just to kind of talk a little bit uh, like, uh, about the image itself, just to give some, some context here. So what you're seeing here is, um, whenever you're seeing the dot, the dot itself, if I had the print to just show up, it's, it's about, the dot is about an 80th of an inch. So that's why they're, they're kind of scanned a lot larger, just to get a sense. And um, it's the, the milling machine, which is like a robotic carving machine. Uh, it's, I, I had to, to control it where um, it, 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 it uh, mills can usually like plunge into a material and then drive around. But the type of plastic I was using was melting in all these weird ways. So it actually, every time you're seeing even a line, what's happening is, is it's drilling a dot, it's about an 80th of an inch, it's taking, it's unplunging, so it's pulling out of the material. The mill's moving over just a, a little tiny bit, and then it's, it's drilling back down. And then it's doing that over and over and over and over and over again. So like a single block, even something kind of simple, might be 16 or 18 hours worth of carving. Because anytime you're seeing a solid line, um, it's actually been nibbled over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, I, years later, I, was, I, showed this, I showed some of these pieces, uh, oh, I should keep showing pieces, um, I started showing some, and these are all relief printed on letterpress. Uh, I started I started showing these in some of the early, even earlier tests uh, at, a, at a talk at Bradley University years and years and years ago. And after the talk, a few people walked up to me and they said, gosh, like, uh, and they started talking in, let's just say, like deep CNC machine code geek. And I was like, whoa, I'm exposed. They know, they know way more than I know. Uh oh, what's happening here? And, and lo and behold, uh, just in this moment, they said, you know what? We have, a, we have owned a machine shop for the past 35 years, and just in the last two or three years, we decided to start an artist residency program, and we'd love to get you out here again this summer and, and have you work with some of our master machinists. And I can't tell you how lucky I was that somebody, that this, this, these, these happenstances, these things kind of happen. You, when, you know, when you're on the path that you don't know where it ends, it, you just kind of got to go for it a little bit. Um, here's another another piece. These are again all these like three three inch by uh, four inch blocks that have been ganged up the way I'm, I'm printing them. These are, by the way, just uh, these octopus. The first series we're looking at here is from an aquifer series. The second series, which I created while I was in residence at the Prairie Center of the Arts in Bradley, uh, in Peoria, Illinois. Um, these are much larger. The image area is about 20 inches by 20 inches. Again, the dot size is, is still the same. It's actually twinkling, which I kind of like, but that's, that's not what it is. It's just, just a <laughs> um, So, uh, I, in, in all of these particular works, I'm showing you the, the jumping off point for me about the drawings, uh, and, and which feeds into some of the other work we'll look at tonight, too, is um, I'm, I've been fascinated for years about the floaters in my eyes. I don't know if any of you have floaters. Uh, I do. Uh, there are these big chunks, actually, for a long time, I, I thought that I was the only person that had these, and then I started reading more and more and more about what that was. Um, and you know, so, so some people like uh, certain diseases will cause like uh, degeneration of the aqueous fluid in your eye and like or the vitreous. Uh, and so for, for me, it's just you know, there's like different structures that get built up in your eye when you're when you're uh, being built in your in mother's womb. Like there's there's like a, like your growth process. There's different structures that then fall apart and then just kind of float around in there. And I, I can anyway, I can make out a lot of these. I've oftentimes thought of these as my personal constellations that I drag around with me. And everything I'm looking at, they kind of line up, sort of, sort of like this living Italo Calvino like, sort of moment where it's like, oh, well, that must mean something. They line up that way. And so this, this, these series of drawings are very much me trying to respond to this, um, this visual sort of artifact that I'm, I'm thinking about a, a great deal of the time. Uh, and so, just again, just, just kind of, that's, that's what this series. Uh, the Celestial Workshops and the Aquifers series. Again, these square ones are all uh, pretty big, 20 inch by 20 inch plates. And I was really 
uh, and, and I'll, I'll go out of my way again to say it, I was really lucky to have met up with the folks from the Prairie Center of the Arts because when I was working at four inches by three inches and it was taking 16 hours to carve one of these plates, to go up to 20 inches by 20 inches and, and you know, have to deal with issues of flatness in plane, like what does it mean to have a plate that's going to be flat in every dimension across 20 inches? Because the robots uh, that carve these, um, my robot that carve, uh, they, they really are precise. They're almost too precise uh, to a certain so So as the, if you can imagine the plane, the Z of your material, to me and you, it might be okay if it's 10 thousandths out between here and here. And that might actually be a problem for a, for a robot that can keep it can keep the Z pretty flat. Anyway, uh, so uh, these, uh, yeah, I, I, again, I really like the jittering. It's totally not in the work, but I can go with that. That's, that's really okay with me. So really thinking about um, these notions of, again, constellations, uh, the internal, the external, the idea of vision uh, becoming image uh, as opposed to the other way around, uh, or maybe both, who knows. Um, working this way, working with um, working with CNC milling and printmaking and just sort of at that time definitely running by the seat of my pants and, and sort of you know bringing in a lot of collaborators to help me figure out how to make the materials do the thing I imagined they should be able to do even though it didn't have to work out um, I started to ask a lot of questions of printmakers and I said gosh who else is doing this right I'm not there's no way that I came up with this idea and at the time, when I first started asking, folks just, just there weren't really a whole lot of answers. And I, I just couldn't believe it. I was like, no, there's no way. I can't possibly be. And so, um, so actually, I ended up, um, uh, this is a book then that I wrote uh, with uh, uh, my collaborator, uh, Dr. Angela Geary. Uh, this just came out in 2012. Um, I, I'm jumping here just because, uh, in fact, there have been a lot of people uh, printmakers, diff different ateliers. Some of them identified as printmakers. Some of them identified as sculptors. Some of them identified not at all with that world. And I, I thought it was just fascinating as I started to do the research to figure out who might be using um, CNC tools. So that could be things like laser cutters, routers, milling machines, water jet cutters. I was really thinking about subtractive processes. So machines that would take some block of something and remove pieces from it. Um, right now, we're definitely at a moment where you've probably heard a lot about uh, additive process machines, so 3D printers. Those are certainly ascendant, though they've been around 30, 35 years. That, that technology's been out for quite a long time. We're at this moment, of course, where affordability of those has made them very accessible. They're much more of a cultural object that you could talk to a lot of people about today, whereas 10 years ago, 3D printer, you, you might have to find someone, a specialist, who was aware of their existence or, or, or how they might be used. In any case, um, so why I, I, I bring up the book, Post-Digital Printmaking, is um, for a few reasons. Uh, it's, it, first of all, to tell you, you're, I, I hope you know, uh, you can't really tell where things are going to lead. Um, and, and I think it's really important to both be confident to move forward and also recognize that um, uh, you have to kind of understand in yourself when you have a sense if it's working, whether that's conceptually or practically, or if you're working with a material and it seems like the zeitgeist is responding to it, you might not necessarily have all the answers and you might still have to act. You will have to reflect on what you're doing as you're doing it. But you know, ultimately, um, I, I wouldn't want energy to get stunted by knowing or not knowing. Knowing can come through making and doing, and that's just as important as research and all the other modes that are important to use. Uh, something I, I want to go with on, on this is just understand that uh, as I started to do the research, it became clear that there was a 15-year history at least at that moment in time of people working with uh, all these different tools, and they just didn't have a for many different reasons, some people weren't using the same language. There was no like organizing principle to talk about these works as a way to work. 
And I thought maybe that was an issue. I thought, well, maybe if there's other people out there like me who wake up one day and go, oh, I should really do a, I should really put drawing software together with this, together with this, together with this, maybe it would be great to give some sort of a, a history and a philosophy of this idea and give some, some texture. And so the book, really, a lot of it, the first two chapters, the first chapter is a, is a philosophy of what am I talking about when I say post-digital printmaking. Second chapter dives into the history of many, many, many artists uh, and even industrial uh, artists and industrial machine tool makers who have been doing things with this idea, in my opinion, for over 150 years let alone the connections that exist between what had been for a long time termed computer art, which is a term that really um, dates from around 1965 to, say, 1985, in that kind of range. There was a lot of folks working, uh, a lot of pioneering folks for the new media field who were working under the guise of something called computer art, who were also making a lot of works that fit into the same type of material um, the relationship between the screen space and the printed space. And, and so this book allowed me to have a forum to, to talk about that history. And then there's about 10 or, 10 or so chapters of case studies on um, different ateliers and different artists, again, some who self-identify as printmakers, others who don't, that work with these tools, some very experimental, some people building their own CNC tools, and some, you know, like there's a place in New York, uh, Twin Palms, where they're working with Chuck Close and Mel Bachner. So it's at every end of the spectrum, uh, from your blue chip artists working with ateliers all the way to, you know, individual people in their studios sort of dreaming up this smoke machine. And so, um, so I, I bought a copy of the book, and, and later, I, you know, people can flip through if you're interested. Uh, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going, because I, I kind of like this synaptic leaps thread, uh, and I, I I want you to understand and know that actually my, my practice is both, um, it, it involves things other than printmaking. Some other materials I've been thinking about, down at Columbia College where I teach, um, uh, I have a, I, so I, I teach at a, I, have, I run a graduate program called the Interdisciplinary Arts and Media MFA, uh, and in my program I teach a lot of like installation, electronic work, uh, we'll bring in people who have performance backgrounds, we'll put them next to people who have writing backgrounds, we build really, really varied cohorts. It's all about proximity and generosity is how you, how you make new things happen, in my opinion. In the department, so there's also the Center for Book and Paper Arts, which is this sort of world-famous place for letterpress and paper making um, and uh, book binding. And there's actually, in the department, there's an interdisciplinary book and paper arts MFA. And my good colleague, Mel Potter, and I I've been talking a great deal about how there are certain terms, like let's say craft or handcraft, that are really important and are like sort of self-identified with the field of paper making, and yet they are oftentimes not identified with, with like worlds like the new media world. And in our conversations, I was like, we, we, we both came to the realization that, you know, in fact, there is real relationship between these things. The hand, the human hand, actually has a place in both things like hand paper making as well as in new media. And in new media, when I think about like um, handmade custom electronics, that's people working with handcraft in order to make, uh, you know, make outcomes that, that, that draw on, uh, uh, that, that not, it's not even a, a stretch. People are working with handcraft. You, you could make that argument. Anyway, so we did. Uh, and we've, we've been working for a number of years on this, this project we call Handmade Media. And the idea here is to, um, the short answer, is uh, we've been thinking about what would it mean, first of all, to make handmade paper and you create uh, electronic, handmade electronic inclusions. So uh, with paper, if you make a single sheet, a very, very, very thin sheet, and then put something down, like let's say some handmade electronics, uh, let's say some L-wire, uh, cold neon te technology, and then you take another very, very thin sheet of paper and put that on top of it, and then put that into the press, uh, we've spent a lot of time figuring out what handmade electronics can survive a 6,000 PSI press and then come out and after they dry out still be able to work. So here you have a handmade sheet of paper that actually has some L-wire like emanating from within it. A different piece here is also using the L-wire technology where we're using more of a L-panel where the whole entire panel lights up, and this next image, I think, uh, gives a better sense of 
how here we're able to take the L wire, the light through the pulp, so that the image, um, so that the paper has both an interior and exterior. So this is not a light uh, box behind it, it's actually the paper itself lights up when, well, when you plug it in. Um, we'd also been thinking a lot about pulp. Uh, another series of experiments where we were playing with, um, this is actually carbon, we were pulping carbon fiber, which is, carbon fiber is actually uh, conductive. Uh, we're working with also pulping like stainless steel and some other types of materials. Uh, what's a little hard to see, although actually you can kind of see it, um, is here I've got my, uh, we've got our uh, paper, uh, and we've got a multimeter, so uh, we've set on a ohm meter, a continuity meter, to figure out if we're able to, and, and here you can kind of see the needle showing you that in fact current is flowing between the two points of the multimeter here, where we, we built this sort of um, uh, conductive pulp for conductive paper. Uh, we, we have ideas for how we might work with this, though. Uh, we realized that working with uh, pulped carbon fiber, which is basically like pulping fiberglass, uh, wasn't maybe the best idea. Uh, and so it was a very itchy day, very, very itchy day working on that. And so we're trying to figure out how to make our conductive pulp less toxic soon. Um, and again, this is not ink. We, we work a little bit with conductive inks, but we were really curious about what does it mean for the conductivity to be part of the materiality of, of the, the paper pulp. Um, some of our L-wire experiments, uh, this is actually at, uh, in San Antonio, we had a show uh, at, for uh, part of the Luminaria Festival uh, for, a, for a month. We were working again with, uh, on, the, on the left side, you can see some of Mel's, uh, she, she's uh, done a lot of research in uh, the Georgian Republic, and she's thinking a lot about Tusheti rug patterns. Um, and over here, you kind of see some of, some of the pieces we made together, uh, where I've been thinking again about some of these floaters in my eyes, uh, and some, some of those, those same ideas, but expressed then in this, in this other material, just kind of, oh, good, okay, uh, just kind of showing, showing some of those handmade media thoughts. Some of the most recent things that we've been doing um, uh, with this handmade media idea uh, is, I'll have to show you in process where we're at, but here what you're seeing is, um, these are tiny, uh, well, they're about an inch and a half wide. These are tiny planar voice coils. And so what I mean is, um, these are actually uh, our attempt, uh, so a voice coil uh, is a uh, part of a speaker, like a, like a normal amplified speaker. And a lot of times a voice coil will be made cylindrical. And so voice coils, when you run power through them, like audio power, uh, audio power is uh, bipolar. So it goes between, like, uh, let's, just say negative one and one, even though it could be amplified uh, different ways. Uh, and the voltage going through a voice coil will turn that into an electromagnet. And because the polarity of the voltage going through it is changing, the poles in the electromagnet are actually flipping back and forth. Now, if you have an electromagnet that's flipping back and forth, and then you have a fixed magnet fixed near that coil that's changing, well, sometimes, you know, if you've got two north poles and a magnet near each other, they're going to push each other apart. If you've got a north and a south pole, they're going to pull each other together. Well, this is how the speaker works, by the way. Uh, so, uh, so that the, the fixed magnet next to a changing magnet uh, allows the, the, the voice coil to vibrate very fast, so fast like the sound of uh, single hand clapping is the joke uh, I like to make if you're a sound engineer. Uh, and moving so fast that it's actually moving the air and space, the top air column. Anyway, uh, even though those are normally made um, in a cylinder, uh, you can make them flat. You can, you can spiral that coil that can turn into an electromagnet in a flat plane. So what you're looking at here is actually each one of these is a little tiny voice coil. Um, and this, what we've been working on, is that actually it's an eight-channel sheet of paper. Um, so here you see us actually taking those voice coils. And, and what will end up happening is we'll be able to run sound, uh, run audio through this and have sort of a landscape kind of piece where I could move sound uh, from one section of the paper around. I don't have a finished one of these eight channel sheets to show you, but I can at least show you just visually what one of our single channel tests look like. So here you have a single audio channel that happens to have three voice coils. If I set little rare earth magnets below this and run amplified sound through it, the whole thing is, is audible in a very quiet room. Uh, but with an eight-channel speaker, the idea would be that uh, people would, could get up to, uh, to, to this, again, a landscape uh, to work through. Ooh, okay, I'm doing like, okay, so uh, the next body of work I wanted to talk about 
a little bit is, is some of the installation work that I, I've been doing for a series of years. Um, this body of work was very active, I'd say, between 2005 and 2012 or so, even though I've, I've got some studio experiments that I've, I've been thinking about where this will go next. Um, again, thinking about this notion of floaters in the eyes, uh, this, this body of work, uh, this one here is uh, towards a vast reservoir of comments, although there's, there's a number of names for each of the installations. Uh, I was thinking about how to use uh, overhead projectors to work with some of the objects that I collect uh, in, my, in my studio practice uh, as a way to create these, um, uh, these collages in real time. And I was thinking a lot about the unfixed image. So here you have um, an overhead projector uh, being used to create, and, and I'll just jump down to show you what the surface of one of them looks like. So here you can kind of see I'm working with these objects that I have, tons and tons of things that I've collected uh, where I'm thinking about certain, certain shapes both formally and then also um, conceptually what, where, where they're from, um, to construct these images that are unfixed. It's, it's light, it's light and shadow. Uh, and uh, constructing these in, in space, um, I'm also thinking a lot about, uh, in these installations, where I'm working with uh, a z giant, uh, I would say, xerography, even though it's basically these, uh, I've, I've worked a lot with, uh, Osei makes these giant Xerox machines. Uh, and so above, on, on the ceiling, and here I've, I've kind of got the front view and the side view, it's this big 15 foot wide by maybe 38 foot long um, Xerox print uh, that hangs over the whole entire uh, installation space. And so for these, I'm, I'm really, and those, and the images on the xerographic prints, a lot of those are made where I'm working in the studio, either with my scanner and treating it like a camera with a lot of the same objects, or I might be working with the overhead projector and taking pictures of that, and then working back in Photoshop and creating these, these kind of constructions. So there's fixed images and unfixed images, and in both cases, I'm thinking about responding to this idea of the floaters in my eyes that make these constellations that walk around with me. Um, this is an earlier uh, iteration. This is at Washington State University uh, in Pullman, Washington. Uh, different view of that same space. Um, actually, in the back corner, you can see one of the large uh, xerographic prints. This is about maybe 15 foot wide by 20-ish foot high. I've probably got the size exactly wrong, sorry. Um, and so there's this interrelationship now. I wanted to start to talk about how, you know, here I am working with um, overhead projectors, but uh, just to show, uh, as I was working on that piece, um, there was uh, in this advanced printmaking class being taught at San Francisco State, where I was teaching at the time, and they reached out to me and they said, wow, we really like how you're formulating images. Maybe, maybe one of these xerographic prints, perhaps we could find a way to talk about that in the context of these other printmaking languages. So this is actually um, a print that was made over the course of a semester working in concert with a whole class of students. Uh, and actually, so what, what they did was they took what was basically a flat, to me, a flattened Photoshop file that we flattened out, and we deconstructed it. So we, we took different parts, uh, and what you're actually looking at is, and I'll, I've got some details where you can see the differences between the colors, but. What you're actually looking at is um, much of the, the very flat uh, black is actually a woodcut. So one person sat, uh, this is about 20 inches wide by uh, maybe 30 inches tall. So one person uh, sat the whole semester with a, with a Dremel and, and carved everything that's the flat black. Everything that's not, where you're seeing kind of over here where it's that slightly more uh, uh, like gray kind of black, that's actually a, a litho. So we were trying to match up a litho with a woodcut with, um, with this gold stenciling that I was doing. And then over here, what you can kind of see is after we had put together all of these prints, um, so we, you know, we, we printed and printed and printed, and I, I thought, man, I have this great idea. You know what we should do is, I'd love to do wet and wet watercolor on top of all of it. So you know, I have all these print papers, are like, oh my god, we're making an edition, they all needed the same. And I was like, well, what do you call it if the edition isn't the same? And they were like, well, it's an edition of RA. I was like, well, that's what we're making then, because I want to do watercolor on this. I want to I wanna have the chance to like make them have this cloudiness to it. And so you just have to kind of respond to, to the things that are in front of you. Uh, here's uh, from uh, the 1708 gallery in um, Richmond, again, working with some of these, these same ideas with the overhead projectors. 
Um, you can kind of see, um, this is actually, I, we won't have too much time to look at this one, but it's a double print. So there's two prints right next to each other, and you can kind of walk in between them. Um, this is a show at uh, Dayton, uh, in Dayton at uh, Wright State University at the Robert Delane Stein Galleries. This is 2011. Um, here, what I'm working with a great deal, uh, first of all, is a, this amazing space, just a giant gallery, and you can kind of see here how uh, there's a giant mezzanine, and so there's a hole, and this print, where you see the bottom of it here, you see the top of it here, it might become clearer, that we're kind of working with the space that's both uh, very horizontal and very vertical at the same time. And again, thinking about creating these huge prints, this is about maybe 40-ish feet, but it kind of loops back up on itself, so it's a double, double-sided double print. You can kind of see, see it from here, you're also seeing it from there. Um, thinking a great deal about uh, the overhead projectors and the Xerox, the fixed and the unfixed, and how both of these can be expressed in time. Um, and this is just, I, I kind of showed, this is the, another piece from the entryway, but I mostly do it just to kind of give you a sense of the scale. Scale is so hard in documentation for installation spaces to get a sense of how it, how it envelops. Um, I work a great deal with uh, reflective surfaces, uh, very interested in the watery, um, and so uh, working with, with things like mylar mirror uh, in the context of some of these installation spaces allow me to uh, create some of these types of reflections that, that themselves jitter a little bit. Um, uh, it's just these are just some stills from the from the over. This is from the overhead, and I show this in contrast to an image um, where this is uh, an an image. It's a digital image, you know, uh, and and so I, I I don't you know it's it's very possible for materials to move back and forth very quickly. You can move, you can have a concept or content that can be expressed in multiple different multiple different materials. Here I'm working with. Um, again with the overhead projector, but this is more in, in the context of the studio. What I wanted to show really quickly uh, here was just some videos uh, that are a little bit more, um, and I'll just kind of, I'm, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna watch the whole thing. I just wanted to show you some studio experiments of um, how I was, I was working with the overhead projectors then in the studio uh, and thinking about well, what would happen if I started to film them, especially with a high-speed camera, uh, and thinking about how then these objects, which were objects, which were three-dimensional objects, could then become flat images on the wall, which then could become, um, you know, these celestial bodies in space, which are then, you know, sort of reflective of these celestial bodies I'm imagining inside my eyes. Um, and it was kind of zipping around. Like, you know, it's just, this is like studio experiments. Like, what do you, these, these aren't, I don't know if these are done or not. I mean, I've shown them as done, but, um, this, the studio is this place where you can learn more about both the images and the content and the concepts that you're working with. Um, and you need to experiment. You just need to. Uh, because things can come out of experimentation that might uh, otherwise not, not be able to erupt. Um, and so uh, where that goes is into a piece like, say, this, where, um, uh, so this is a, a 20 minute a single channel video, and usually, and just to, I'm going to scrub through it just because it's very slow. It's meant to be watched slow, but if you see it fast, you can kind of see what I'm what I'm then doing with some of these these raw images. Uh, this piece here, this this uh, a lot of times what I'll do when I'll show this is I'll show it. It's a dimensions variable. So if I want to show this as a two channel video piece, I can start channel one at zero and start channel two at 10 minutes, and then they're always out of phase. And so you can kind of, you know, if I want to, I can take a little bit of material and fill a very large space. The same way I walk into the gallery with, you know, a little suitcase full of objects and a little suitcase of overhead projector. And you can, you can make image larger than the space that it took up when you carried it in. So there's, there's these, these issues of scale and changing scale that are very curious to me. Um, and oh, good, good, good. Um, and so with this idea of scale, um, I wanted to talk a drop about some of the latest work that I've been developing over the past three or four years, uh, this project Visible from Space. Um, Visible from Space uh, started uh, and continues to be a thought experiment uh, that, that began with this question 
Uh, what would it mean to create drawings on the Earth so large that you could see them from the moon? Um, and so with that starting point, which is uh, fraught with some failure uh, in case, uh, you know, I, I wonder, well, how could you do that? How big would a drawing need to be? There's all this popular mythology of what's visible from space and things that actually aren't. And as it turns out, you'd have to have a, a line about 60 miles wide. That would be the stroke width of your line in order to be able to see a drawing on Earth. And I thought, well, gosh, that's awfully, um, there, there's an awful lot of hubris in an idea like that. Even just thinking an idea like that has some obscenity to it. And then simultaneously, there's some degree of engineering that seems almost within reach. And somehow that, 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 uh, that captured my attention. And I wondered, you know, even if a machine doesn't um, function, can we run a machine? Can you run a broken machine? Even if it doesn't function, might it work? And work in the con context of, of concept. Can a concept work? And so um, uh, I, I worked on this project uh, the first uh, uh, for a number of years. Uh, we were, I had a residency out in Death Valley at this place called the Goldwell Open Air Museum. Uh, and I lived out in Death, near Death Valley for about a month in June. It was great. It was, as I purposely wanted to go to this place and be like, OK, what does it mean when you go to the desert where you're 40 miles away from the Nevada test site, which has its whole history. And what does it mean when an artist wants to take a creative practice into the desert, this site of remote testing, uh, to try and work out ideas and work out thought experiments uh, in sort of this creative laboratory atelier. So I started working with um, uh, rockets and balloons and, uh, you know, and, and thinking about what would it mean to create installations in, in, inside a barn, what would it mean to create installations and drawings outside, what would it mean to try and spy back down on those drawings, and honestly, what this all overlooked was the idea that in the desert, in fact, there's a constant, or at least here, there's a constant 30 mile an hour wind, and so working with little rockets and balloons and all these things are a great idea, but what happens if you do it anyway? What happens if you just keep going? What if it's not functioning, but if you just keep making it work? And I was kind of curious about what, what that might mean and what it might do, do to my work. Um, the, a lot of these images that you've just looked at here are from around 2009-2010 at, that, uh, at that, this residency in, at, at just outside of Death Valley. Um, and, and honestly, for a little while, I wondered if this work was done. You know, I thought, well, maybe that's, that's a complete kind of thought. The last few years, uh, and it's similar to this idea of laser cutters and other things becoming much more accessible by price quality now, well, lo and behold, uh, drone technologies have become very, very, very accessible, uh, and you can buy hobbyist drones. So um, this past year, I actually returned to a residency in Bisbee, Arizona, called the Central School Project. Um, and at the Central School Project, I started working with uh, thinking about how drones might provide me with a way to think about creating these spaces. So some of the pieces I'm going to show are um, from these experiments that I was doing in uh, June of 2013, so just this, about a, not almost a year ago now, uh, from that period. So I'll, I'll show some of these and then we can kind of go from there. Uh, so let's see, let's watch this one. And this might be a little loud, but it's meant to be a little loud.
someone who are
you know, there's, it's inspired both by this idea of creating the drawings on, on the earth so, so big, but I, I'd say, yeah, the floaters are still in there. I mean, you're seeing some of the, like, the, you know, so hopefully you're starting to see like some of the live process video of the overhead projectors where I've been working with that and then thinking about, you know, putting that on the Pico and like flying it on the drone and having that be in the space, but it's, it's also about that and these huge chalk drawings that we're kind of thinking through. So, um, yeah, even though I'm identifying it as visible from space, it's, it's hard to know where one body of work precisely ends and the other begins. And that idea, I guess, is, is just sort of with me. And you saw it in some of the prints, you saw it in some of the installation work. And so short answer is, yeah, I think you are seeing that here as well. Yeah, Patrick. OK. Um, let's see here. Um, by the way, I have tons of photos myself. So I, I, yeah, yeah. Right? So anyway, <laughs> The one thing I notice in a lot of your work is you know this sort of like diagrammatic sort of like set of like radicals and you know and um, me you know, measuring structures and things like that. And I'm just kind of wondering whether this is something that is sort of indicative of the sort of quantification that's inherent within technology. Mm -hmm. You know, just sort of expressing itself. Yeah, in other words, we, we, in many ways, those of us who work with technology, you know, often have like, you know, little scales or little, little things like that. And, you know, it's, I'm just wondering whether it's, you know, maybe just something that's incidental, like, like that, <laughs> like, like, like that, um, um, weather balloon shot, you know, you have the, the round and the little back hole and, you know, things like that. And it's just something I find curious. Um. So is it is it a, like why 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 have that artifact? Or? Well, yeah, I'm just I'm just wondering whether it's something that you're reflecting on, or it's something that just maybe comes up as a natural expression of your culture. Yeah, I wonder that too. I, I do think there's definitely in this latest body of work, I am going out of my way to think about measurement a great deal. Um, there's a number of, the, the, the videos I've shown you are um, a lot of the work that I was doing in Bisbee, Arizona, which is right about six miles away from the Mexican border. I was working in a third grade classroom. This old mining school shut down and a bunch of artists took over. And I think in, when I was working in that space, this notion of measurement um, and thinking about scale, thinking about my space program is the size of this third grade classroom and wanting to go out of my way to talk about scale and how this visible from space idea, which might be obscene but possible at certain scale, is actually, um, I, I wanted to make reference to the fact that you, you can't, hopefully, or maybe you can, tell when you're looking at something as big as the universe or as big as far as away and, and, and like trying to hopefully have the vision slip back and forth. So I thought maybe having some reference points that refer back to different types of scales could help people uh, through that world. There's actually, um, I, I'll play it without the sound because sometimes just while we're, while we're talking. Or possibly mislead. Yeah, or possibly mislead. Yeah. There's actually, um, some of these are just are, are ex experiments where I'm not totally sure where they're at, but I'll, I'll show. So this is where I'm working uh, also inside. So here again with some of those, you know, I'll just kind of like, I won't even go full screen, but again, thinking about some of those measurement devices and wondering like, do I leave them in the background? Like, like, like they are in the pieces I showed first? Or do I make them these very, very active participants, these active props? Um, and I, I for, for this, body of experiments I'm playing with, you know, I'm kind of going out of my way to have some that are black and white and some that are colored, just to demonstrate to others how I'm thinking about the space that they're creating. Um, some of these actually end up, uh, ooh, uh oh, I didn't show the other one. But 
But some of these end up, you know, um, not just inside, but, um, you know, some of them end up outside, too, thinking about what, what that, that um, type of, you know, <laughs> device then helps us think about out in the landscape. Um, you know, so I, so and anyway, I, I don't know if this is your question, but I'm going to say it was, uh, yes, measurement does have a lot to do with this project. Uh, and certainly the scale of vision, uh, I, I think, is, is something that's within the control. Oh, uh, it's about uh, uh, two and a half pounds, as you notice. We did our test to figure out how much it could lift. It couldn't lift the 16-foot long one, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, so, I, I, so it's about two and a half pounds. Uh, but we could talk more about what that does do better. Uh, so. <laughs> Surely there are other questions. Well, you, I'm going to go in the back. You have a question. Okay. Um, what was your like primary field of study in school? Oh, thanks. Yeah, no, that's um, so. My undergraduate degree uh, was in theater design, uh, so like lighting design, sound reinforcement, a little bit of directing. It's strange though. I, we were just having this conversation. I feel like I was just saying this to one of the classes I visited today. Actually, I, when I went to school, I actually went for philosophy. Um, and uh, it seemed so hands off uh, that working in the theater was this, it was this magnetic pull. I, I had never actually worked in theater in any way, shape, or form. So it's kind of a theme when I was in college, but I was really enjoying working on building sets and the type of uh, spectacles and, and things that I could, I could create. Uh, and so I started working there. And around, while I was there, I started doing all these research projects um, into, um, I was very curious, so I, was, I thought, well, I'm going to be a lighting designer. That is it. I'm going to be a lighting designer. I love this. And, and, but at the same time, I was doing a lot of like uh, uh, geeky programming kind of things on my own. And I thought, wow, well, you know what would be interesting is I wish I could actually make some kind of a, a visualization to pre, this is like early 90s, I was like, I wish I could pre-visualize my lighting design plot so that I could see what they're going to look like before. And right around that time, the whole ray tracing thing was exploding. But I didn't want to use ray tracing, because that's photorealistic. I wanted to use this other totally geeky process called radiosity rendering, which is um, a, pho it's a it's photometric, so you can actually measure the pixels. And like uh, ar uh, lighting, ar architectural lighting guys would use it. And so I started learning all about radiosity rendering, and it just, you know, you kind of go down a rabbit hole. I, I started realizing that my pre-visualizations were actually the done thing. I was like, I don't even need to, I don't really make, make it in space anymore. So I, I ended up going to grad school at SAIC in Chicago uh, for art and technology, even though I, I applied to the Time Arts program, and then it kind of disappeared uh, right as I got in. And they said, well, you know what, we think you should be an art and tech. And, then I, I, that sort of pulled, pulled me in that direction. So um, I would say I have always been interdisciplinary. I, I, it's, it's, you know, I, I feel like I've always come from that point of view. Uh, I feel like the theater has certain metaphors of making, the idea that many diverse practices come together and that it's a collaborative process. And over the years, I, I feel affinity with other practices like new media, where that in fact is part of the ethos of the culture of making. And in fact, it's part of what reinforced when I started meeting and working with printmakers. In fact, the culture of printmaking is one where there's a great deal of collaborative process. Now, sometimes it's because of the tools, sometimes it's because of the history, sometimes it's just because of the expense. But um, I find there's a great deal of uh, reinforcement and amplification between these fields and what's funny is I wonder, maybe they're all kind of a new media. And then maybe we can drop that term and just worry about making art, which is a good thing too. But great question. I'm sorry I got off topic maybe a little bit. Um, I thought I saw a hand. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I thought I saw a hand. You seem like a very energetic thinker. I was curious as to uh, what sort of organizing you do with your thoughts, or you know, do you write much, just all experimenting? Oh, sure. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I would say that uh, being, uh, it's important to also reflect on the idea that I'm also a faculty member. And um, that puts pressures on different parts of your year that are, um, everybody responds differently to those types of pressures. I know some folks, some, some colleagues, who are really good at like this sort of stratified layer where they're able to like 
for a half hour a day they do this, for an hour a day they do that. I, I'm more of a immerse in it and do something for a month and a half and like it'll start to make sense to me kind of person. So during the year, I would say, like during the school year, I would say my studio practice is much more reflective. I'm writing a lot, um, I'm diagramming, I'm learning, to, you know, lots of new tools, some of which I might not use, whether it's programming languages or machine tools or whatever. Um, I'm doing a lot of sketchbook drawing. I'm doing a lot of imagining. And then uh, a lot of times I'll use my, my longer breaks, whether it's the summer or the winter, to, to work very heavily in the studio and, and immerse. Uh, just because for me, continuity helps me um, reach that state. And then through the year, I can kind of reflect. So like, you're seeing some of the experiments from Bisbee that I've, I've had a chance to kind of work through and edit into shapes that I can then give back to people. So I would say um, that's, that's how I would describe my, my studio practice. Yeah. So you wrote the book, and here, um, in, in, you know, you're been around and sharing all these ideas and um, what you've learned with a lot of, of artists. And have you, now that it's been out for a while, um, have you looked and, and seen it put into action in ways that you could never imagine? Well, actually, thank you for asking. Um, the I at this at this last uh, SGC International Conference in San Francisco. I actually it was the moment where because I, I had actually presented on the book last uh, at the the Milwaukee SGC. Um, we had a panel. Actually, a lot of people came, but I think right at that moment, because the book was about six months out, people just hadn't heard of it. It didn't have a chance to kind of have um, kinetic motion in the field. But at this last one in, in San Francisco, I was I was. I was myself was stunned. I was like, oh my goodness, people are reading it. It's out there, it's out there in the world. People are, are, are commenting on it. They know, they know what I'm doing. So I was, I, so I think the short answer is, yeah, I was really impressed that in fact this is, I, I, feel, I feel comforted that in fact the field, a generous field by the way, has, uh, is using the book to kind of um, coalesce around an idea. But in terms of unexpected, and I, I hate to be like this, but it's what's, what was shocking to me was that some of the predictions that I made in the book, uh, some of the things I expected actually have happened. And they have happened a lot faster. So what was unexpected to me is that I didn't think it would happen quite this fast. So one of the things I comment on in the book a lot is how plunging prices is going to lead to a radical rethinking of the printmaker studio. And I was kind of thinking in the next five to ten years. But the truth is, it's all over the place. I don't know that I could write the book now the way I wrote it then. Of course, that's probably always true, uh, partially because I wrote the book, so that probably has something to do with it. Anyway, um, I, but I don't think I could write the book now because the field has has like it's a it's I hate to say it's it's awake to this idea. Everybody I talked to was using routers or laser cutters or this or that or the other thing because. As I said in the book, I was like, I really do think that the prices on these are coming down, and you've got academic departments all over the United States buying them. You've got maker labs and hacker spaces buying these. It's too, frankly, obvious of an idea. Somebody's going to run with this. In fact, the, the thing that's got me now is, um, one of the things I said in the book is, gosh, there's real, not really that many people doing additive. So like 3D printing to end up being matrices and in fact, in those last two or three years, I've got a catalog of all these examples. Um, there's, a, there's a really cool press down in, um, in Tallahassee uh, at, the, at uh, uh, Florida State University has the uh, Facility for Arts Research. It has this huge, like 80,000 square foot research building just for arts research, which is kind of awesome. Um, and it's just filled with machine tools and this and that and the other thing. And uh, one of the things that they've been doing uh, one of the, the facets of the Facility for Arts Research is the Small Craft Advisory Press. And the Small Craft Advisory Press, uh, Denise Bookwalter, if you know her, uh, she's been doing some work with um, uh, where they're 3D printing like type and, and doing letterpress with 3D printed type. They're also working with, uh, there's this machine called, um, oh gosh, so there's this, so we talked about laser cutters, this one, that this really exotic process is this thing called a laminated object modeler. Uh, so, laminated object modelers are usually used in, I mean, big industrial processes, kind of hands-off. What they do is they would take a sheet of, let's say, something like MDF, they put glue on it, 
that it would like laser some outline, then it would take another sheet of MDF, put that down, put glue, laser through, and do that over and over and over and over and over, and over, and over again. Then you end up building a 3D object out of slices. So it's laminated object modeling. It kind of makes sense in a sec after you know what that we're talking about. Well, there's a company out of uh, Scotland called MCOR, and they built, uh, they have, they built a machine, about forty or fifty thousand uh, dollars, which is really reasonable, and that will come down in price. Um, that that uses copy paper. It does laminated object modeling on eight and a half by eleven sheets of paper and PVA glue, and so they've been using one of these to print. Get this. So they're printing out of paper. I don't know what to call it. Type. Wood type? I guess it is wood type. <laughs> uh, so they're printing wood type out of laminate you know, like, oh, and they put back on the letterpress. And as they print it, it goes and goes and goes, and it starts to break down. And like the pages, the individual slices start to like separate. And so there's there's new ways of making that are just erupting. And that's an incredible moment to be a maker. It's it's just an incredible moment. And so um, I think I'm I didn't expect it to happen this fast. Would be I, I assumed it would take years, so and I guess it did, but I meant many more than, than just one or two. Yeah, in the back. I have a quick question about how you approach adopting a new technology into your practice. Do you go into it with kind of abandon and naivety, or do you research a ton and see what else is in the field, or is it a little bit of a mixed bag? How do you approach that? Yeah, the, the short answer is it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, and I think it also relates to the, this other gentleman's question about what is your studio practice. So during the year, I'll be experimenting, and I mean like from the point of view of looking at and evaluating many, 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 many technologies constantly. And so many of them, honestly, are, um, uh, I guess the, the negative way to put it would be a lot of them are dead ends. A, a slightly less negative way to put it would be some of them aren't useful yet, um, and so uh, you know, and so I, to me, that's part of my research process is to constantly, frankly, keep up, and you know, it it, ins it inspires me. I think one source of energy from looking at how things work. I'm very curious about how systems work, whether those are mechanical systems or material systems or software systems. Um, so, you know, at any given time, I might be trying to think through a few of these. And I don't always know if they're going to turn into things, right? So, like right now, I'm researching uh, how do blimps work, how much are blimps, where can I get a giant blimp, um, uh, and I have some answers, so like blimps are coming. Um, and then, you know, I've been looking at like uh, uh, Video analog synthesizers, been doing some work with those. I've been working with mechanical television, has been a side project. Um, I've been thinking a little bit about uh, lasers, like laser projectors for doing large outdoor, uh, you know, blimp control laser projection on landscape. But I don't know if that'll work out or not, but you have to, you have to start somewhere. Even if where you're starting is preposterous, um, and even if that's going to turn out to not work, like rockets in the desert with 30 mile an hour winds. Um, you, you have to start somewhere and respond to the making even as it's going off the rails. So I suppose it's, um, when you said maybe it's a mixture of both, uh, in, I, I don't know if you were throwing that out to be like, oh, this will save you. The truth is it genuinely is a mixture of both. And I'm not sure where, it's such a mixture that I, you know, I don't know if mixture is the right word, maybe it's odd mixture. I'm not sure if, you know, is it, is it a suspens suspension? I'm not sure where one idea begins or ends, but I know that everyday practice is, um, you know, it's where you, where you will find an energy source. And so during the year, everyday practice might be research and writing and then action in the field, which is why a lot of these are called field experiments or field notes. Is in fact, that's what they are, the reflections of taking the, the pretty diagram that says the system's going to work like this, and then what, is, what really happens. And I'm, I'm very curious about that, that sort of um, breakdown in tension. I know, I see it. I see your hand. I just want to make it. Okay, all right. You can have another question. Okay, it's just a follow-up to that. So, sure. okay, when you hit a dip point, oh, yeah. um, how do you know when to, like, sort of abandon the project or to that's a, that's a great question. Um, it's interesting because with, um, 
Okay, so for instance, with the Visible from Space project, there was really a lull. There was this moment, because I had, uh, for the Leonardo Electronics Almanac, some of those images I showed, like the balloons and some of the, some of the stills of the rocket, I created those for Leonardo. They had asked me to do this um, one image a day for a month exhibition platform that they were launching, which was really cool. And I thought, okay, you know what, I think I had all these experiments and these explosions and these problems in the desert, and I think this image series, maybe that's a summary of the idea. And then I ended up having some of the raw footage, which I, I apologize, I, I, there, it's on video, but there's some footage from Death Valley where I was like, okay, well maybe it's this footage. And so, uh, and I kind of thought that was almost maybe, I was maybe done with that idea. It was the, it's the most recent thing that had a dip period. Um, and then all of a sudden, this, this I look at Patrick, because I know he's working with drones too, but um, uh, this, this drone thinking kind of reignited it. And it's similar to how, you know, I, I mentioned, I was like, okay, so like around 2005 to 2013 or so, I was thinking about these overhead projectors. The truth is, part of what soured me a little was that gigantic show. Oh my God. So uh, the giant show on two floors and all this and that and the other thing, I actually had another dozen overhead projectors, but as it turns out, a lot of gallery spaces uh, don't actually have as much amperage as you might think they do. <laughs> And so I was, gosh, I was like, oh man, I'm gonna have to figure out a way to go low power with these. So I've been working now with these high wattage, you know, little LED, and I'm, so I'm trying to work with um, both my knowledge of electrical engineering and then some other folks to help get a low wattage overhead projector where the image is readable. So if I can work out some of those problems, then I imagine that that might erupt back into the fore again. The other way that it can happen, though, would be with, say, some of the earlier work, like the Game Boy work, or some of the browser-based installation that I, I apologize, we just really didn't have time to get to. Um, uh, some of that work I, I felt distanced from because I felt like, uh, and I feel like, um, there are sometimes forces beyond your control, and there's sometimes uh, uh, answers that you would be drawn to maybe through a professional practice answer, and what maybe, I hate to put it this way, but there's answers that I would have needed to do for my net art practice that it would have been more in response to um, how those works could be included in certain curatorial visions. And I was really happy with a lot of those, because of course it's a good thing, but I, I also felt like it was gonna limit me. And so I would say that was a, a, a dip that I decided to distance myself from very, very strategically from the professional practice side of my studio, just because I felt like it wouldn't allow me to do uh, and bring this, this slightly expanded vision of studio practice uh, to the fore. Um, so it just, it takes more time to work that way, uh, but I'm patient. And I think that, um, I, so I think it's tenured, I think, I think, that it's tenured faculty's responsibility to take extreme risks with their practice. If, if, if tenured faculty have been given that privilege and they play it safe, they are absolutely um, overlooking uh, the idea of pure research in the context of the arts. And I think that's a lovely thing. And I, I try and, I, 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 so that's part of what I'm trying to do with, with some of this, um, uh, breakage of my own systems and the, and the familiar uh, and the the, the necess you know what I could repeat versus uh, a little bit more danger. So that's how it is. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you all. For